Good afternoon and welcome to today's industry presented webinar, Nutrition for Performance, Theory and Effective Practice Guidelines for Fitness Professionals. A few housekeeping things before we get started. If you have a question during the webinar, please type it into the question area within the GoToWebinar navigation and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. If your question goes unanswered, don't worry, we'll take all the questions from today's webinar and turn it into a Q&A blog that we'll post on the ACSM website. We also encourage you to join the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter using the hashtag ACSMWebinar. Today's webinar is sponsored and presented by the Wheat Foods Council. The Wheat Foods Council is dedicated to increasing domestic wheat foods consumption through nutritional information, research, education, and promotional programs. Under the expert guidance of its scientific, scientific advisory board, the Wheat Foods Council seeks to increase awareness of nutritional contributions and the benefits of wheat and foods made from wheat to an overall healthful eating pattern. One continuing education credit, courtesy of the Wheat Foods Council, will be emailed to all participants after the webinar, along with a PDF copy of today's presentation. You should receive the CEC and slides in an email tomorrow afternoon. There's no need to email ACSM asking about CEC credit. Today's webinar presenters are Dr. Travis Thomas and Nancy Clark. Dr. Thomas is an Associate Professor of Clinical and Sports Nutrition in the College of Health Sciences and Director of Undergraduate Certificate Program in Nutrition for Human Performance at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Thomas has more than nine years of experience conducting human studies involving nutrition and exercise interventions across the lifespan. He is board certified as a specialist in sports dietetics and a fellow of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Nancy Clark is an internationally respected sports nutritionist, weight coach, nutrition author, and workshop leader. She is a registered dietitian who specializes in nutrition for exercise, health, and nutritional management of eating disorders. She is also board certified as a specialist in sports dietetics and is a fellow of both ACSM and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. She completed her undergraduate degree in nutrition from Simmons College, her dietetic internship at Massachusetts General Hospital, and her graduate degree in nutrition with a focus on exercise physiology from Boston University. And with that, I will now turn it over to Dr. Thomas to get us started. Well, thank you, Nathan, for that introduction. And um, my name is uh, Dr. Travis Thomas, and the title of today's webinar is Nutrition for Performance. Theory and Effective Practice Guidelines for Fitness Professionals. And as this title implies, there are two parts of this presentation. First, I'll have the honor of discussing the theory behind the current sports nutrition guidelines. And then Nancy will discuss practical approaches for integrating these guidelines into your practice. So I'd like to start by providing you an overview. I think it's important to first start off with um, discussing um, the current um, position stand and giving you an overview of this important review paper that was published in March of 2016. This paper, this review paper is endorsed by the American College of Sports Medicine, Dietitians of Canada, and the Academy of um, Nutrition and Dietetics. This review paper um, is an extremely thorough, extremely vetted, systematic review that evaluated scientific literature in the field for over a decade in all the key areas of sports nutrition. So we want to start with this so that you understand all that went into the development of this important project. And then we'll transition into the areas that are covered within the paper that will likely pique your interest, um, that are certainly covered in great detail within the paper. Some of the areas include um, personalized sports nutrition, um, the concept of energy availability, macronutrient needs for the athlete, fluid needs before, during, and after exercise, and also dietary supplementation. So I'd like to start with just showing you the reference for the Nutrition and Athletic Performance paper. As I mentioned, this, public, this was published in 2016, and this, and this particular reference um, is in the Medicine, Science, Sports, and Exercise Journal. This is roughly a, a 20 to 25 um, page um, um, review article um, that covers all the important areas of um, sports nutrition. Again, this is a joint position um, statement that is an open access article that's available for all of you to download and, and read and utilize into your, uh, in your practice. A joint position statement, again, that is supported in, a, in, a, in the position for the um, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, Dietitians of Canada, 
and ACSM. The um, writing for this position paper um, began in uh, mid-2014. Um, the authorship team was led um, by me. I was the lead author representing the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Kelly represented uh, Dietitians of Canada, while Luis represented um, the uh, American College of Sports um, of Medicine. Um, the, um, this two-year effort of writing and sorting through the literature would not have been possible without the hard work and support of, of the entire team. Certainly, Luis Burke and, and Kelly brought unique per, uh, perspectives um, to this project and certainly made for a diverse team. To give you a little bit more um, a background on the development of, of this paper, um, a key component of the paper was a comprehensive evidence-based analysis that spanned between um, 2006 and 2014. Um, this evidence analysis was conducted by an independent group of sports nutritionists that identified key questions in the field that needed to be answered by the literature. These questions were answered and graded by this team, and then they were provided and or handed over to the position paper authorship team that again consisted of myself, um, Kelly, and Luis. We then, the authorship team, conducted our own review of the literature and integrated this evidence analysis into the paper. The last position paper of this kind was published in 2009. Again, it addresses key questions in all areas of sports nutrition, and it has huge impact. It is, position, it is the position of all three of these organizations for the next three to five years. And as I tell my students and my colleagues, it's a very important resource to use and to highlight in practice and to compare um, to all the new literature that's being published in the field of sports nutrition. So this leads us to the first topic, one of the key areas that we covered within the paper, and that is personalized sports nutrition recommendations. The, the importance of periodized training schemes have been recognized in the exercise world for years. We also know this is important for nutrition um, recommendations. Nutrition recommendations should also be based on dynamic training and competition needs. And ideally, nutrition periodization, period, periodization should match training periodization in preparation for peak athletic performance. And this should take into account the needs of, of both daily training sessions and overall nutrition goals of the athletes. And these daily training sessions can range anywhere between minor, in the case of easy workouts, all the way up to very substantial substantial daily training sessions, in the case of high intensity, strenuous, or highly skilled workouts. And as you um, look through the um, position stand, you'll notice that there are different themes that are um, um, structured throughout the paper. The major, um, one of the major themes, or theme one, um, focuses on the daily training nutrition needs for the athlete. And when you focus on or think about the daily needs for an athlete to promote optimal performance, the cornerstone of sports nutrition recommendations should focus on energy needs. How much how, or how many calories does an athlete need day to day, week to need, week to week, based on their training periodization? Appropriate energy intake supports optimal body function. So this is not just about um, athletic performance, but it's also about health. Optimal energy intake also determines the intake of macronutrients and micronutrients and assists in the manipulation of body composition. So no um, discussion of changing um, body composition is complete or comprehensive without a discussion of, of changing or manipulating energy intake. Um, along those same lines, since I did bring up micronutrients, um, it's important to note that carbohydrates, uh, carbohydrates are the primary macronutrient that makes up the energy intake that athletes need. Carbohydrates belong in the center of the plate of any athlete and are more likely to be under-consumed than protein as a macronutrient. And these con concepts hold true across the continuum of athletes, from the elite athlete to the recreational athlete engaged in exercise and sport. The key difference here to think about is that the is that athletes or elite athletes just need more energy, calories, and nutrition. This is an important concept that I think oftentimes is, um, that is um, overlooked. 
And um, one of the, the, the next um, key concept as it relates to energy intake is the concept of energy availability, or EA. The position um, stand, uh, this paper, recognizes the significance of the female athlete triad as it relates to energy availability. The female athlete triad, also known as simply the triad, uh, is defined as any movement in the continuum away from optimal menstrual function, bone health, and optimal energy availability. And has been expanded, um, this has been expanded on to recognize that energy availability is important to maintain health and to maximize training outcomes in both males and females. With low energy availability, we have a concern about um, a condition known as the relative energy deficiency in sport. And this can result in unwanted loss of muscle mass, menstrual um, dysfunction, and hormonal disturbances. It can also result in suboptimal bone density and increased risk of fatigue, injury and illness, impaired adaptation, and a prolonged recovery process. The next topic of the position um, stand that I think is important to cover is the, um, the, the importance of dietary carbohydrate in the athlete's diet. And um, there are several aspects of dietary carbohydrate that are important to cover, um, both in the daily training diet and also in acute scenarios. In the interest of time, I cannot cover each of these um, areas, but since most of um, the paper is focused on the elite athlete, my primary focus is going to be on daily maintenance um, needs for the athlete. What does the athlete need to consume on a daily basis to, um, to, to, to meet um, carbohydrate needs to, to, to support performance? And um, the, the scientific basis for that is to support um, optimal uh, muscle glycogen stores, to support high-intensity efforts and work output. So this leads me to um, a collection of, of studies that were published by um, Burke and summarized in two different panels here. And, and this illustrates the importance of daily carbohydrate needs. The panel here on the left shows you um, the amount of glycogen stored within skeletal muscle in millimoles per kilogram of wet weight. And the x-axis here shows you the amount of grams of carbohydrate in um, grams per kilogram body weight on the x-axis. And what we see um, simply within this graph is that most athletes um, um, do not have adequate um, glycogen um, to support high-intensity efforts until they consume a minimum of six grams per kilogram of body weight of, um, of carbohydrate. So take a moment to think about your grams per kilogram body weight or some of the athletes that you work with that rely on high-intensity effort, efforts and think about how much carbohydrate that may be in their daily training diet. The other point I want to make is um, being careful about assessing uh, carbohydrate intake based on percent of energy intake. Because oftentimes we can have a perception of, um, of someone's carbohydrate intake, or whether it's high or low, based simply on the percent energy intake. Someone's consuming 40% carbohydrate or 70% carbohydrate, and we assume that that's high or low. But in reality, the science tells us that we need to dose carbohydrate in the daily training diet based on grams per kilogram body weight. And that most athletes need between five and 10 grams per kilogram body weight. And this graph illustrates that some athletes may be perceived as having low percent carbohydrate intake based on percent of energy, but may actually have um, adequate um, grams per kilogram. But on the other hand, you could have someone that's perceived as um, very high, but actually may have a low gram per kilogram intake um, especially if their needs are um, at 8, 9, or 10 grams per kilogram per day. So this brings us to the actual recommendations that are listed within the paper for daily training needs. These are the current recommendations for um, carbohydrate intake for the daily training diet. These current guidelines are starting ballpark figures intended to promote what we call high carbohydrate availability when high intensity efforts for the athlete are important. Notice that these targets are based on body mass, as I mentioned in the previous slide, and they're also based on the exercise load for the athlete. Also notice that there's no single cut point, and there's also an overlap in the amount of um, carbohydrate that we might recommend. Um, we also recommend, um, uh, we also acknowledge within the position stand, um, as you read it, you'll see this, 
um, that high carbohydrate availability is not always important for the athlete from week to week or day to day. Some quick examples of that is that there's some, there, there's some cases where athletes may want to train at lower intensity. Okay, in those cases, they need less carbohydrate. There are other times they may want to focus on enhancing a specific training stimuli. In some cases, they may want to withhold carbohydrate. More on that later. There may also be a personal preference. For instance, there's an athlete who may want to train at 6 a.m. in the morning and just decides not to consume carbohydrate before their morning long endurance run. So there, there are several examples where um, um, there, there may not always be high carbohydrate availability. But what I should say is that a dietary carbohydrate intakes in gram per kilogram should usually match the fuel needs for the athlete and the training needs, also their glycogen restoration needs. Um, and recommendations, again, typically range for the elite athlete between five to 10 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. And of course, these guidelines need to be fine-tuned according to the athlete's overall dietary goals and their feedback from training. I want to emphasize that because these are starting points. And, and, and any starting point also usually comes after an assessment of, of what they're usually consuming and um, how they're performing. So um, these are starting points that I want to um, make sure that you, um, you understand. So uh, now what I'd like to do is, is uh, focus on this area of um, train low. And this is a, a concept of, of, um, of sometimes restricting carbohydrate during um, training in an effort to try to promote improved training um, adaptation. And this is um, usually um, a, a common a topic that I've, I've heard um, among athletes and also within in personal training circles. And I just want to bring this up because um, I think it's important to look at the evidence, and we, we certainly cover this within the position stand. So what I provided you on this slide is um, within the white text here, um, these are the claims on, on how restricting carbohydrate could um, potentially be beneficial. And in the gold text below it or is what the current evidence suggests. So the biggest point I want to make on this slide is that there's currently no evidence based on the best research available that restricting carbohydrate enhances athletic performance when athletes need to compete at high intensities or they need to train at high intensities. And that's the biggest um, point that I want to make um, from this slide. And in reality, some um, athletes, and in, in, in some cases, many athletes already train low. In some cases, as I mentioned before, sometimes this can be unplanned or it could be by accident or it could be by design. By design. What we're concerned about in the sports nutrition world is that by adding additional train low strategies um, may actually decrease performance and in some cases could cause harm. And that's the focus here on the, on the next slide. And um, as you see here, there are many concerns that could be associated with athletes um, um, restricting uh, carbohydrate by design. And the science that we outlined in the position stand does not currently um, support train low strategies. And while, the, uh, while we do not currently support these train low strategies, we also recognize that um, during times of low training volume, we understand that a reduction of carbohydrate in the training diet may be necessary. But it's important to differentiate here. This is not the same as training low or restricting carbohydrate. We're just simply adjusting carbohydrate to meet training um, demand. Um, so, Clearly, restricting carbohydrate is different than simply, simply reducing carbohydrate, and training low involves some clear risks that are outlined here, ranging from reducing the level of intensity that you can train at um, to increasing your risk of injury, in increasing your risk of illness, and also promoting, in some cases, metabolic inflexibility. In some cases where um, carbohydrate is reintroduced um, after a period of low carbohydrate availability, availability, carbohydrate is not as oxidized as well and not utilized as well for energy to fuel the athlete. So in summary, I want to provide some key points for active people. So even though the paper focuses on the um, elite, more of the elite athlete, I want to point out that carbohydrate needs are lower for the non-athlete or the rec recreational athlete. And these typically are between three to five grams per kilogram per day. 
But when you compare this absolute amount to fat and protein, it still is more than these other macronutrients. And they still take center stage when constructing a healthy diet. Um, carbohydrates also promote disease prevention and longevity. And in fact, they're the only macronutrient to consistently show that in the evidence. Um, protein and fat does not do that. So healthy carbohydrates in the form of grains, fruits, and vegetables um, are associated with disease and prevention and longevity over time. Um, and then the final point I want to make is if you're concerned about um, carbohydrate intake, is that self-monitoring and planning are, are, are so key and I think are often overlooked. Um, we have to make sure that we are matching our carbohydrate and energy intakes to our exercise expenditure on a daily basis and a, and a weekly basis in order to, um, to make sure that we are um, maintaining weight and we're also um, promoting optimal body composition. Um, and then when we're doing that, patterns and timing of um, carbohydrate-rich meals and snacks can be chosen according to what's practical and enjoyable. Some final notes on carbohydrates. We know that restrained um, eating practices interfere with meeting um, targets for carbohydrate intake, and they may also impair glycogen storage. So this is a significant issue for our athletes who need to train in high intensities or compete at high intensities. And even when um, athletes are interested in reducing carbohydrate intake, again, that's not necessarily train low, but if they're reducing carbohydrate, pre-exercise nutrition strategies um, are intended to promote high carbohydrate availability when high intensity efforts are important. And those strategies are also outlined within the paper. So now I'd like to transition into to protein. Um, the good news about protein in athletes um, as it relates to athletic performance is that most athletes eat enough protein. And in the scientific um, literature, um, the focus has clearly shifted to providing enough protein at optimal times to support tissues with rapid turnover, such as skeletal muscle, and to also augment metabolic adaptations initiated by different training stimuli. So the, the total daily recommendations for um, protein intake typically range from 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram for body weight per day. And as I mentioned, athletes typically do a good job at this. Not always, but overall they do pretty, pretty uh, well at this. Um, so, but most of these recommendations have now recently been um, expressed in terms of regular spacing of protein intake of modest amounts of high quality protein of 0 0.3 grams per kilogram of body weight after exercise and throughout the day. Um, such intakes can generally be met from food sources. And um, we also um, point out in the position stand that adequate energy is needed to optimize protein metabolism. And when energy availability is reduced, um, examples of that, when an athlete is um, interested in reducing body weight or body fat, uh, higher protein intake than what are recommended here at 1.2 to 2 may be needed to optimally support muscle protein synthesis and the retention of fat-free mass over time. Um, I want to provide um, a, a, some brief comments on fluid recommendations for athletes. Um, the recommendations here um, cover before exercise, during exercise, and after exercise. Um, certainly when we think about these um, recommendations, I think it's important to think about the entire spectrum of what's, um, uh, what's defined as an athlete, from the recreational athlete to the, to the elite athlete. Certainly, depending on the athlete type, the type of exercise, and the environment that they're in, there are certainly situations when these fluid goals are uh, more important, and sometimes they're less important. Um, but a quick comment about the during exercise recommendations. Um, certainly, these should be customized to the athlete's tolerance and experience uh, to fluid intake during the event or competition, the opportunities for drinking fluids, and the benefits of consuming carbohydrates in a fluid or drink form. The final part of um, the, the paper that I want to cover um, today in this webinar is the um, section on, on dietary supplements. And in the paper, in, instead of focusing on 100 different dietary supplements that seem to always change, um, what we wanted to focus on is, is different categories that are important for the practitioners to understand and to also think about um, strategies such as safety and efficacy and how to teach um, um, the clients that you're working with and some different things to think about from a professional standpoint over time um, when you're evaluating dietary supplements. 
So the three different categories were sports foods, and this includes carbohydrate electrolyte beverages, uh, sports gels, it also includes um, uh, dip, um, bars, um, usually carbohydrate or confectionery type foods to support carbohydrate needs of the athlete. We also have the category of medical supplements. Um, these may be indicated to treat or prevent deficiency. The best examples of these that are covered in the paper are iron and vitamin D um, supplements. But we also covered the topic of um, ergogenic aids. And um, the key um, points um, related to um, thinking about ergogenic aids are outlined here and are covered in more detail within the position stand. Um, but in the overview here is that athletes should um, undertake a cost to benefit analysis to recognize that they, uh, that your supplements are of the greatest value when added to a well-chosen eating, eating plan. So it's not only just a well-chosen eating plan, but an overall healthy lifestyle. There's very few instances where uh, a poor uh, eating plan combined with a dietary supplement um, where the dietary supplement is proven to be effective. So we always start with a healthy eating plan first. We should also think about a pragmatic approach to advice regarding um, dietary supplement use. Uh, this is needed in the face of the high prevalence and interest in and the use by athletes. Uh, we need to be open-minded um, skeptics um, when we're evaluating um, the efficacy and safety of dietary supplements. And we need to recognize that there is evidence that there are a few products or few dietary supplements can, that can usefully contribute to a sports nutrition plan and or directly enhance performance. Um, a final couple of slides here. Um, the ergogenic aids um, should only be used after careful evaluation for safety, efficacy, potency, and compliance with relevant anti-doping codes and legal requirements. Certainly, we're, we're focused on the general diet first, um, and then we move up the pyramid to consider sports new, uh, foods as necessary, and then finally, ergogenic aids if it, if it fits the profile um, listed here to the left. And then my, um, my final point here um, are um, the, uh, the effectiveness of, some, of dietary supplements. And in the position stand, we only um, highlighted a few, a select few dietary supplements um, provided here on the left, in the left column. Um, sports food, medical supplements such as vitamin D, then creatine, caffeine, sodium bicarb, and beta alanine as your um, buffers. And then nitrate, um, commonly found in beetroot juice, but also in the diet as spinach and, and spinach and also arugula. These were the dietary supplements, ergogenic aids that had the most um, benefit or the most evidence to support their efficacy um, when used in the proper um, training plan and for the proper um, types of athletic events um, that were indicated um, in the literature. The, um, the supplements here provided on the right were not provided uh, or not listed within the, um, di uh, the uh, position stand because there were not enough, um, um, uh, enough evidence to support their use. So these, again, these were the only dietary supplements that we, we listed. And if you're interested in this topic, there's a, a new paper that was just published in um, the uh, International Olympic Committee in 2018 that goes into greater detail and um, it interestingly uh, covers uh, all the supplements listed here on the left. Um, as, as ergogenic aids that have strong evidence. So um, um, just to provide you some resources here, um, this is where you can find um, the position paper. Um, please download it and use it in your um, practice. Um, as Nathan mentioned earlier, let's continue this discussion. You can find me and Nancy on Twitter and we can, um, we can um, certainly um, answer your questions after the webinar and also on social media. And, um, and now I'll turn it over to Nancy, who um, will discuss more of the um, applied approaches and how you can um, use um, the paper in practice. All set. Thanks, Travis, for that good uh, foundation of all the good science and the research that's been going on in the area of sports nutrition. I gave a talk to a um, ice hockey team. And afterwards, the coach said to me, you know, Nancy, too many athletes show up for training, but they don't show up for meals. They might as well not show up for training. And that coach hit the nail on the head when he said that, because so often focus, the athletes focus on training, 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 but they don't show up for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, fueling up, refueling. 
And as Travis said, that really can be the winner's edge. So the goal of this session is to address the nutrition questions and confusion of both fitness exercisers and athletes alike. And I'll be talking about carbohydrates and the trendy low carb sports diets, looking at gluten-free paleo diets and protein needs and um, the ever ending quest for the best protein supplement. So the information that I'm sharing, um, we'll focus on some of the counseling uh, tips and techniques that I found to be effective among the population that I work with, which is just the whole spectrum, like I say, from fitness exercisers to, you know, aspiring Olympians. And hopefully you'll gain some tools that you can use with the population that you work with. When we're talking about improving an athlete's diet, what we're really talking about is changing their behaviors. And what can we do to help them eat better? It's important to listen, not only to what they're saying, but also how they're saying it. For example, you know, if someone says, oh, I had a bagel for breakfast, that's a lot different than someone said, oh, I had a bagel for breakfast. And there is a whole group of people that have a really negative relationship with food. So listen to what they're saying, how they're saying it, and problem solve with them. I encourage my clients to be curious and experiment with different fueling patterns. Like I wonder what would happen. What do you think would happen if you had like oatmeal before you went on your long run? And they might be fearful that they'd end up having, you know, side stitches or stomach ache or undesired pit stop. But, you know, be curious, experiment and learn from each day. And I always recommend that my clients create a food plan that they're willing to maintain for the rest of their lives. You know, nothing good comes from going on a short-term diet. So when it comes to paleo and keto or any other, you know, trend that might come along, is that really how they want to eat for the rest of their life? So dietary improvements happen when the benefits are bigger than the costs. And so when we're making um, people change their eating beha behaviors. As I said, there has to be a benefit to it. So the benefit might be that they eat healthier, they have more energy all day, that they perform better, maybe they achieve a personal best. Uh, weight management often becomes much easier. But, you know, there's a cost to eating healthfully. And the cost might be you have to plan, you have to go food shopping, plan your meals, food prep, and that can take time and energy. And sometimes you end up eating less yummy foods. Uh, so if you're having, you know, an apple for a snack, you aren't having a chocolate chip cookie. So it's uh, looking at the costs, the benefits, and helping them people find that right balance. You know, there's this perception going around that carbohydrates are evil. And I'm sure you hear this from your clients all the time. I mean, Travis can talk about how great carbs are and how many we should have. But the reality is we're dealing with people who say things like, oh, I stay away from bread. It has too many carbs. And uh, or I'm on the paleo diet. I don't eat wheat or grains. Oh, I don't have pasta for dinners anymore. I have a big salad instead. Oh, no orange juice, way too much sugar. And I'm sure many of you have heard these complaints as well or comments. So, the, you know, the trend is, oh, carbs are evil. Well, the reality is, you know, many athletes don't even know what carbs are. I was talking to one client said, oh, I, I've knocked carbs out of my, my diet. And I, and I was curious. I said, you know, I'm curious, what, what, what do you eat? He said, well, I have oatmeal for breakfast and I have whole wheat bread for lunch. I've got brown rice for dinner, but I don't need any carbs. So, you know, we have to find out what are you actually concerned about? You know, what is your definition? Is it refined white flour, natural sugars, you know, high fructose corn syrup, you know, refined sugar and candy, you know, or is it just all fruits and vegetables and grains? And most people, when they say they're on a low carb diet, if you were to ask them to define it, they have no idea what that is. Do they mean just like no grains and starchy foods? Is it a keto diet with less than 50 grams of carbs a day? Is it less than 130 grams of carb a day, which, what is, which is what the American Diabetes Association recommends for diabetics, to, people with diabetes to have at least 130 grams of carbs a day? 
or the dietary guidelines suggest 45 to 65 percent of calories from carbs so less than that is that what they're talking about so there's a lot of um just amorphousness <laughs> in talks about carbohydrates and what's high what's low and what's the right amount so it's really great that the new position stand really specifies um you know how many carbs grams carb per pound of body weight now this carbs are evil message really isn't appropriate for athletes those messages about carbohydrates are really designed for the people that are over fat under fit not exercising and that's the majority of americans so when we talk to sports active people and athletes it's just a tiny little segment of the population and their body metabolizes carbohydrates so differently than the average American's body. So here's just one study that shows how exercise helps to regulate blood glucose. And it's a study with a 12 week study done with obese subjects. And just look at how much insulin, how much less insulin they needed pre to post study. And that's just with 12 weeks of exercise. So if you take someone who's been working out and is very fit, the, their body's ability to handle carbohydrates is very different from the average Americans. And as Travis says, their body needs the carbs in order to refuel properly. So the way that I get this message across to my clients, I have a private practice in the Boston area where I work a lot with people one-on-one. -on -one is to go to the science and show them this study. And uh, what this shows is that when you exercise hard, you deplete the glycogen that's in your muscles. Now, if you're anti-carb and you come back after your workout and eat protein, like a protein shake, a protein bar, um, that doesn't refuel your muscles. If you have a chicken Caesar salad, that also doesn't. Or if you have a whole pile of chicken wings, you know, or fried chicken, you know, protein, protein, fat, fills your stomach, but it doesn't refuel your muscles. So if you do hard exercise and come back and have oatmeal, banana, um, you know, pasta, bread, sweet potatoes, grains, fruits, vegetables, those are the foods that refuel the muscles. Now you do want some protein to build and repair, but three times more carbs than protein. So this study also shows that it's within the hour after you exercise that your muscles are most receptive to refueling. And if you've been totally depleted, it can take up to two days to fully recover. So, you know, there's this myth that the window of opportunity is, you know, right after you exercise, but that window doesn't slam close. That refueling can happen, you know, over the space of a couple of days. Here's a sample low carb training diet that is typical of so many people that I work with. They are very proud of their healthy eating. Um, they have their you know, spinach and cheese omelet in the morning along with their turkey bacon. They have nuts for a snack, you know, a salad with grilled chicken on it, protein bar in the afternoon, a big piece of salmon with a pile of broccoli at nighttime, 60 grams of carbohydrate. You know, how is that going to fuel their muscles? Only 11% of their calories. Now, we know that this can hurt performance. Here's a study done with ice hockey players. And during a hockey game, muscle glycogen declines by 38 to 88%. A motion analysis of elite ice hockey teams showed that the players that had the higher carb diet skated 30% more distance and faster than the players who ate the standard diet, which was a 40, only 40% 40 carbohydrate. And in the final period, the high carb group skated 11% more distance and the low carb group skated 14% less distance than in the first period. And the researchers concluded that low muscle glycogen can jeopardize performance at the end of the game, and that's when games are won or lost, and that three days between games with training on two of those days, plus an inadequate carbohydrate intake, does, let me just undo my phone, um, does not replace glycogen. That's in the players with a high carb diet had 45% more glycogen than those on the lower carb intake. And the differences in performance between the groups was most evident in the last period of the game. So think of not only ice hockey, 
soccer, basketball, which is going on right now. Um, but any of these intense sports, really sports nutrition is critical. So limiting, I have athletes that say, oh, you know, I get my carbs from fruits and vegetables. You know, I, maybe I've given up the grains, but I, I get, I eat lots of fruits and vegetables. Well, if you get rid of the bagel at breakfast, you know, maybe you could replace it with 16 strawberries, a couple of blueberries and a medium banana, you know, make it a big fruit smoothie. And that's within the realm of possibility. Um, if you get rid of the lunch sandwich in that bag of pretzels, and have a salad instead. In that salad, you need 24 cherry tomatoes, two cucumbers, two carrots, two large peppers, and five cups of greens. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of time to eat it all. It's also a lot of fiber. And I know a lot of athletes are concerned about undesired pit stops. No pasta at night. You replace those two cups of pasta with vegetables. Well, you need to eat two cups of cooked kale. That's a lot of kale eight spears of broccoli, three cups of cooked zucchini sauteed with a large onion. So grains can be very helpful for athletes who train hard. And I'm not, this isn't to say that you can't get the carbs that you're needing from fruits and veggies, but you can save yourself a lot of money by filling up on grains. Now, if you aren't getting in enough uh, grains of fruits or vegetables and are eating a low carbohydrate diet, your glycogen stores get depleted. This is a study um, done with runners that ran 10 miles hard three days in a row. They were college runners. They ate the standard school food, probably too much protein, too much fat, maybe too much beer, not enough grains, fruits, vegetables. And in three days, you can see what happened to their glycogen stores. Now that's three days. What happens in three weeks, three months? And that's where every day, these athletes need to think about fueling up and refueling. They're either fueling up or they're refueling. It's one or the other. And that's where it's important that they have the foundation of their diet be um, you know, rich in grains. But I feel so much better when I don't eat grains. I'm sure you've heard that as well too. And the question is when someone says that, what were you eating before you switched over to your paleo diet. And very often the answer is, oh, I was eating the SAD diet, the standard American diet. And when you're eating haphazardly, missing meals, you know, grabbing fast foods or whatever, not paying attention to what you eat, of course, when you switch over to a paleo type diet and you're eating on a regular schedule, you have better energy. When you're eating more fruits and vegetables, you feel better. It feeds your microbiome. Your microbiome affects your whole mood. And um, so there are many reasons why people could feel better just by eating on a schedule. But each person is an experimental one. It's important to listen to them and have them be curious and experiment. Now, some athletes do need to be gluten-free but they also can get adequate carbs. So it's important for us as dietitians, the dietitians that are in the audience, to really know food and um, to help these athletes that are gluten-free to recognize that rice, sweet potatoes, corn, starchy vegetables, you know, can all provide plenty of carbohydrates, you know, dried fruits and fruits, to know which sports foods, you know, kind bars, cliff bars, whatever, provide um, are gluten-free. And if 1% of the population has celiac and another 6% is gluten sensitive or gluten intolerant, that means that 93% of the population probably can eat, you know, um, grain foods just fine. Now, when people say that they feel better when they give up wheat, um, the question is, are these GI gastrointestinal issues are they caused by FODMAPs? FODMAP stands for fermentable, which means gas producing, oligo di monosaccharides and polyols. And these are just different kinds of fibers. And we happen to have lots of fructans, which are a type of fiber, which for some people creates gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea. Um, 
intestinal distress. So it's not the gluten that might be the problem, um, but these other fibers. And they need not be on as strict a diet as a gluten-free um, person with celiac might, um, but to figure out what level of FODMAPs that they can enjoy. But some common FODMAP trigger foods that lead to intestinal problems um, include, you know, wheat, lentils, beans, sorbitol in sugar-free foods, onions and garlic, they're everywhere. Apples, you know, these are some of the ones so that when people have intestinal problems, you know, I would in, explore, you know, this whole FODMAP issue with them. You know, what's the right balance of protein and carbs? You know, here, Travis and I are pushing carbs and the whole athletic population is going protein. Uh, so that's what they're pushing. You know, Travis has gone over the protein requirements and, you know, it depends on if you're, you know, building muscle, if you're a growing teenager and the people that are restricting calories, those are the ones that really have the highest protein need. But you take these weight conscious you know, um, athletes in lean sports, they're the ones that tend to eat fewer calories and, and might be in need of uh, and a little bit of extra protein. But the majority of athletes do eat a high protein diet without even knowing it. And if they have eggs for breakfast, snack on cottage cheese, have a chunk of turkey for lunch, Greek yogurt for snacks, some sort of protein at night, they can easily get their protein. So in this example, 160 grams and 150 pound athlete might need only 80 to 115 grams of protein a day. The problem as Travis mentioned is that people are eating it at the wrong time. So here's a study looking at some Dutch athletes of all different kinds and they looked at their protein intake, getting adequate protein. But if you look at breakfast, the percent, percent of the protein that they ate at breakfast was only 19%, or is it dinner? That's where they got most of their protein. And for those who got less than 20 grams of protein a meal, which is a really good target, you know, 58% of them at breakfast didn't get enough protein. And at lunch, you know, a third of them didn't get enough protein. So we really want to look at meal timing and protein pacing throughout the day. So when I counsel clients, I look at how much, what, what are their protein needs based on their body weight, divide that into three meals and snacks. And for most athletes, this could mean, you know, 15 to 20 grams of protein every three to five hours. So if at breakfast and snack, they have 20 grams, you know, lunch and snack, they have another, you know, 20, 30 grams, dinner, dinner snack, they get more. So that it's, it's having them redistribute it but there's really no benefit to eating more than 40 grams of protein a dose. And we know how the average American eats, you know, their dinner could easily be 40, 50, 60 grams of protein at nighttime, but just oatmeal for breakfast or coffee for breakfast and just a salad at lunch with no protein in it. You know, questions come up about amino acids and all the, the athletes that comes about, am I getting enough protein? What's the best protein supplement? Is like, do you really need a protein supplement? No what about amino acids? And you look at these ads and they're very convincing. But if you want amino acids, this is where I look to food. And this is our job as dietitians to know food and to translate the, 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 the sports nutrition research into what do you do? You drink chocolate milk, you have tuna fish for lunch, you have cottage cheese for snacks, you know, chicken for dinner. You can get plenty of leucine, which is a very important amino acid to trigger muscle protein synthesis and all the other amino acids as well. So if you're wanting additional information uh, to help your clients to win with good nutrition, certainly ACSM has a whole list of their position stands. The Center for Nutrition and Athletics is another website abundant with excellent nutrition information. Um, my website includes a blog that might be of help to you. And we have left time for some questions and some comments. So let's see if we can, um, you know, continue this conversation. Great, thanks uh, both Travis and Nancy. It was very informative. Um, we do have about 10 minutes uh, for questions and I've got a ton of them here. So I will try to get to as many as I can um, in the next couple of minutes. So the first couple ones are actually coming 
when uh, when Dr. Thomas was talking, but I'm sure either one of you guys can jump in with, with comments. Uh, this one comes from Susan. It says, when calculating uh, carbohydrate or protein needs, do you need to adjust for obesity or do you just use present body weight? You want me to answer that first, Travis? Sure, go ahead. Sure. Um, I would, you know, the, the protein needs are often for athletes, and I haven't met a lot of obese athletes. So if someone's obese, I would, well, one, look at what their exercise is, how intense it is, and just make sure that they're eating a balanced diet. Travis? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd go to these recommendations as um, um, maybe a starting point, but they're also probably not too far off if they're starting a new exercise program, trying to lose weight, trying to improve their body composition. Um, there, there's certainly evidence that suggests that um, a slightly increased um, protein intake that's distributed throughout the day will promote satiety, fullness, and help um, retain uh, muscle mass as individuals lose weight in an exercise program with slight energy reduction. Okay, we've got another one from Jessie. Uh, she asks, what are the current recommendations for low volume, high intensity training activities? Um, I, I don't know as far as these specific recommendations. We could go in many different areas here um, as far as calories and protein and, and fat. I'm not sure if I can if I can answer that with that. Um, there's not enough detail there. Okay. Um, here's one from Caroline. Uh, can you discuss the difference between elite and recreational athletes? And also contrast with non-athletes active people, you know, how are these terms defined? Um, well, I can start off on this and maybe maybe um, Nancy can chime in as well. Um, certainly, I think it's important to um, to note that the, the structure of this position stand as you um, download it and use it and, and practice and consider it, um, it's primarily, um, the, the primary focus is, is for the, the um, elite athlete, the division one collegiate athlete, the um, professional athlete, um, not as much for the recreational athlete. Um, you know, some of the primary differences between um, these groups of, of athletes is the level of commitment, the hours spent training, the energy expenditure of, of exercise and training, um, the stress that's put on the body. Um, so a lot of the recommendations that are provided within this position stand are to support um, those types of athletes with greater intensity and volume. But that's not to say that some of the athletes who are very serious that are more recreational or the weekend warriors can, can't still take some important points away from this um, position stand. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just chime in that a lot of times, you know, fitness exercisers, here's the here's information about, you know, we got to recover right away. And the question is, did they, in their half an hour walk, you know, did they deplete their muscles of glycogen? Do they have to be as concerned? Because um, they haven't, as Travis says, they haven't done the intensity that an athlete would. And, and, and for example, the, the carbohydrate chart that I showed, um, that gives you an idea of some of the intensity and volume that's required. Um, and then you, when you look at that and look at the volume and intensity, you can start seeing some separation of uh, as far as what you would um, find typical for um, and more of an elite uh, level athlete versus a recreational athlete. And you can see some clear differences in carbohydrate needs. Okay, the next question comes from Kathy. Uh, she said that the term high quality protein is used frequently by uh, sport dietitians. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by high quality uh, when it comes to protein? I would uh, say that high quality protein is protein that includes, you know, all the essential amino acids. So we're looking at, you know, meat, fish, chicken, dairy, soy, um, 
or combinations of beans and rice and, um, you know, and, and just, you know, the, getting the right balance of the plant proteins. Okay, the next one from Michael. Uh, do you agree with the statement that if somebody is eating correctly, then dietary supplements shouldn't be needed? I would say that my job is to teach people how to get the vitamins that they need through the foods that they're eating. So if you consider that in 1,215 calories of a you know variety of good clean foods, people can get the, the vitamins and minerals they're needing. That if you have an athletic person who's eating 2,000, 3,000 calories a day, you know it could be easy for them to get abundant nutrients. You know, if one glass of orange juice gives you the vitamin C that you need for the day, and if you drink or thirsty and guzzle the whole quart, you know that's quite a bit of vitamin C right there. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, I, I do think there's been a lot of effort to um, determine determine um, the the ergogenic aids that um, have the the best evidence base. And although there's relatively few when you consider how many dietary supplements are out there, I do think the ones that we um, outline within the position stand um, certainly have a role. Um, especially in the elite athlete where, um, you know, a, a hundredth of a second can make a difference between meddling or, you know, not even, uh, you know, not even placing. Um, those, those things are, are key. I, I wouldn't totally, we have to be, like I said during the presentation, we have to be open-minded skeptics. There, there's certainly, I think, a place for them, um, but, um, but not necessarily for every athlete. And we certainly want to follow a food first approach. Yeah, and There's so many things that we should fix. We can fix with food first, usually. Yeah, and, and I, I think a, a nutrient of concern certainly is iron, particularly for female athletes. And just iron deficiency is, is prevalent. Um, so, you know, nutrition is such a one on one conversation that it's, it's very hard to make, you know, blanket statements. It is. I think we've got time for one or two more. Uh, this one is from Alice. Uh, she asks, do athletes who do different sports need different carbohydrate needs based on how tasking their sport is? Travis? Yeah, I, I, would, I would say so. And I would refer, refer back to the, um, the table that I showed um, that as far as how tasking the sport is. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that's related to um, the the in intensity and also the duration. I mean, those are those are two um, variables that that play into um, um, the daily carbohydrate needs for athletes. Okay, so we've got one more here. We have about a minute or two left, um, and this one's from Anna. This will be our final question of the day. Are there any repercussions for too much protein in an athlete's diet? Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll take this. Um, and, and sure, Nancy, you have some uh, may have some comments too. Um, I, I think there's a there's been a um, an interest in, in the field to to look at some longer term studies on the effect of, of higher protein um, diets and to to assess whether or not they have a long term in impact, especially on kidney health. And I think what we're seeing, in, at least in some early studies. Um, that and if there's not some sort of um, uh, initial um, kidney or an, um, um, nephropathology, um, there's not really strong evidence that suggests that um, at least the protein recommendations that are provided within the position stand are going to promote any sort of um, negative long-term health. And some of the evidence is suggesting, especially when you're decreasing the energy intake, more protein may be indicated to um, help retain lean tissue over time. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is that um, as protein intake increases, one concern that I have, and I don't get good um, answers for when I when I question this in the field uh, for people who are advocating for more protein, is the concern over diet quality. As you increase protein intake, you are also perhaps displacing other foods, especially carbohydrate foods, foods that are tied to longevity and disease prevention. And when you're doing that, that's a concern that I have. And so there, there's certainly a place for 
perhaps some increase in protein, but we have to make sure that we get healthy carbohydrates in our diet. Yeah, no, I, I would uh, agree with that, that if you're having, you know, a six egg omelet, you aren't having oatmeal with banana. And, and so it's finding that right balance. You know, the, the other interesting thing, too, is that a lot of people these days are just having lots of protein powders. And there was a report just came out through Consumer Reports looking at how a lot of these protein powders have heavy metals in them, like lead and arsenic. And they listed some name brands, which are like pretty common name brands. Um, so food first, as Travis said, food first. Excellent. Well, thank you both for a very uh, interesting presentation. I know uh, I definitely enjoyed it. Hopefully the attendees did as well. Um, again, if you did submit a question and we didn't get to it, uh, we'll do our best to uh, turn those into a blog that will be on acsm.org and we will send you guys an email uh, when, that's, when that's up. So as a final reminder, uh, an email will be sent tomorrow uh, with a link to the CEC, as well as a recorded version of the webinar. Uh, and they'll also have a link to the slides. So uh, look for that tomorrow afternoon. And with that, this concludes the webinar. I want to thank everyone again for attending, and have a great afternoon.